knows a lot about the science stuff, Professor Dave explains. In the previous tutorial, we looked at some organisms that are described as maybe primates, but now let's look at some organisms that followed, which were undeniably primates. The first primates were admittedly not exactly what most people think of when they imagine a primate. As we saw, the first primates were likely barely distinguishable from tree shrews, or scandentia, although their teeth, ankles, and wrists were beginning to look more familiar. The adapids and omomyids would arrive next on the scene, some 56 million years ago, and while they certainly look like some of the primates we know and love today, their relationship to these modern forms is murky, to say the least. For this reason, we will be discussing them in terms of current consensus, although as science is known to do, this may be subject to change as more fossils come to light. Adapids are considered to be more closely related to today's lemurs, and omomyids to today's tarsiers. This is rooted in each group's respective morphology, and suggests that adapids were likely diurnal animals, while omomyids ruled the nights. This would also mean that these families may mark the divergence of strepsirene and haplorene primates. Adapids were enormously widespread, enjoying a whole host of available arboreal niches across Europe, Africa, and Asia. Some grew to pretty decent sizes, with Leptodapis at around 20 pounds. Adapids had larger body sizes than the Omomyids, and they may have used this slower metabolic rate to adopt some folivorous or leaf-eating strategies, if their high-cusped cheek teeth are anything to go off of. This doesn't mean some of these animals didn't also exploit the growing number of fruiting trees, but suggests that diets ranged widely based on where the adapted in question lived. These organisms had some radical morphologies that appear to have convergently evolved to resemble some of the old world primates. Canines were beginning to become prominent, with certain species even exhibiting some sexual dimorphism, as seen in the genus Notharctus. This is fascinating, as modern lemurs have quite low sexual dimorphism, and when it pops up, it is the females who reap the dimorphic benefits. Female ring-tailed lemurs are larger than their male counterparts, and in brown mouse lemurs, females have the larger canine teeth. Darwinius massili is a fascinating adapid that had several characteristics which originally had the type specimen, Ida, pegged as a potential haplorene. She lacked a tooth comb, as well as grooming claws, but a full trait analysis ended up placing Ida with the strepsirenes. Her fossil is impeccably preserved, with her fur still clearly visible and her last meal identifiable. It was leaves. Ida was found in a lake deposit known as the Messel Pit, which was rich in CO2 back in the day. It is thought that this lake would periodically belch up toxic gases, and that Ida was leisurely enjoying the lakeside before she fell unconscious from nearby CO2 fumes, and slipped into the waters where she drowned and sank to the sediment below. Ida had largely flattened nails on grasping hands, a post-orbital bar and a split lip, along with a brain case quite large for her body size. When her suite of traits is considered, it seems quite obvious she was a strepsirene primate. Most adapids had smaller orbits, or eye sockets, than most omomyids, which is one of the reasons the former are thought to be committed to daytime activity and the latter to the nights. Omomyids resembled tarsiers more than anything else, including their sharp cheek teeth, which suggests an insectivorous diet. Modern tarsiers are considered to be a part of the superfamily Omomyoidea, but belong in their own family, Tarsieridae, rather than the family of most ancient omomyids, Omomyidae. Omomyids certainly lacked many features the anthropoids would come to know. Their orbits weren't entirely closed, meaning the allosphenoid and zygomatic bones of the skull weren't in contact. It had a primitive dental formula that varied by species, and its brain case still had some growing to do. Some omomyids had their tibia and fibula fused, like modern tarsiers, but others had a rhinarium and toilet claw, like modern lemurs. 
This seriously complicates the position of Omomayids in the primate lineage. Perhaps they are wholly unique branches, stem haplorines or stem tarsieria forms, rather than a crown group with living descendants today. But while Omomayids may be a branch that withered in the Eocene, it may have been an Omomayoid that left descendants which would become the first anthropoid primates. It was also likely an Omomayoid that experienced the first break in their Gulo gene, a break we humans and all subsequent members of the haplorine and anthropoid lineage still possess. The Gulo gene concerns the terminal instructions for synthesis of ascorbic acid, or vitamin C. All primates possessing this busted gene must get their vitamin C from their diets. This break is in the same location in all haplorene primates, and given how rare it is in the mammalian class, serves as excellent evidence that this is an inherited trait rather than a break that occurred separately in the same location on the genome in each and every primate species. The gulo break isn't all bad, however, and may give the organism possessing it a superior ability to fatten up thanks to an increased effect of fructose uptake, meaning there is indeed a reason for it to have been favored by evolution, particularly in times of scarcity. Finally, tarsiers are the most basal living primates to have the broken gulo, yet further evidence supporting common ancestry. Most adapiform and omomyoform lineages went extinct when the global climate became cooler and drier near the Eocene-Oligocene boundary approximately 34 million years ago. Their ranges across the globe would shrink, more closely hugging the equator as descendant populations of both would diversify into the ancestral stock of the first lemurs, tarsiers, and anthropoid primates. The first anthropoids, or true monkeys, would find their biodiversity kicked off in an unexpected place, given its status as an arid desert today, the Fayum of Egypt. Let's move forward and discuss what the first anthropoids were like, how they eked out a living, evolved through the Oligocene, and set the stage for the very first apes. Thanks for watching. Subscribe to my channel for more tutorials. Support me on Patreon so I can keep making content. And as always, feel free to email me, ProfessorDaveExplains at gmail.com.